right. Um, last time we covered interfaces and we didn't test anything, which is bad. All right. You might say, well, we got clean compiles. And that was always my joke when I was a software developer. Did you test it? Well, it compiled. You know, like compiling doesn't mean that it works, right? Compiling just means that there's no syntax errors, that you haven't violated the, the rules of language. So it's good for us to know that. So like when I come in today, I know I don't have to worry about the headache of like tracking down all the missing semicolons and curly brackets and did I spell something wrong or whatever. But I haven't really tested it, right? And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to create a test class for this and, and run it through some tests. Um, let me download it, and then we'll discuss what we have, and we'll expand it to cover the test class. I don't know if this will take the whole period. If it doesn't, I have a couple of topics that we'll go over, and then we'll go over our next, we'll start our next big topic. All right. So, last time we created. Uh, an interface. And an interface, again, is when things have behaviors in common, and by things I mean classes, have behaviors in common, and they are not part of the same inheritance structure. All right? So we gave a hypothetical situation where we had students, and we might have grad students and undergrads. We had fac uh, or employees, and they might be faculty or staff. We had organizations and all these things they're not going to you know they're not going to inherit from each other all right you could probably force some kind of inheritance but that wouldn't be a good idea right because a student is not a faculty faculty aren't students organizations aren't even people right so you'd have to come up with some kind of bogus entity and oh you don't want to do something like that you want to make your inheritance structure real all right now the thing that uh, these things have in common though is they have a behavior in common uh, and that is that they're an email contact for the college. So what we did is started off, we made an interface for email contact. And an interface can be as simple as this. An interface does not have any attributes, does not have any constructors, and its methods are just the signature of the methods. So we don't describe any code in here. You don't inherit code like you do with inheritance with an, when you implement an interface. When you implement an interface, when you say a class implements an interface, you are promising that any non-abstract classes that implement this interface or whose ancestors implement that interface, have a valid uh, function that looks like that, where the signature matches. In this case, a pub public string get email address. So that's the behavior that all these things have in common, is that they all have email addresses. So the organizations that we do business with, the people that supply us stuff, the people, the customers, the organizations that come in for training, the just organizations out in the community, um, faculty, staff, undergrad students, graduate students. All these students have, all these entities have something in common, and that is they all can get an email. So if they can get an email, there should be a get email address method. 
all right? And we're going to guarantee that. We're not just going to guess if it has a get uh, email address. We're going to guarantee that by creating an interface. And then we're going to implement that interface in the classes that we create. So, I made a function called email. This is meant to send an email. And it has a constructor that is expecting an email contact. What does that mean when I say it's expecting an email contact? It's expecting a concrete class that implements the email contact interface. Right? Because we can't make an email contact. It's not a class. We can't instantiate it. It's an interface. But we can implement that interface, and we can give this function something that has that interface, something that implements that interface. So the constructor is the email uh, contact, the string, the um, a string for the subject, and a string for the body. And then we have a send email. And rather than actually sending the email, I'm just going to print out what the email says. All right? So, um, you know, um, again, we're not actually sending the email. We're just, we're just demonstrating that. So the idea here is this is polymorphic. What do I mean by polymorphic? I mean I'm going to give it an object that implements that email contact interface and down here, when I ask for the email address, whatever method we use to get the email, right? In one case, the email is like the student number, uh, last name and student number, or something like that. In the case of graduate students, it has the word grad after it. In the case of faculty members, it's something else, and so on. All right? So it doesn't matter how the class implements it. The interface simply says that the class will have that method. So let's look at some of these classes that we have. I didn't do everything that I drew out in the chart. <coughs> I did student, and students could either be grad or undergrad. Student is an abstract class. What do I mean by it being an abstract class? It means that we can't create an instance of it. No one is merely a student. You're either an undergrad or you're a graduate student. All right? There's nothing that that's all we can say, that they're a student. They're an undergrad or they're a grad. Notice that abstract classes get a pass. All right? Abstract classes get a pass. So I don't have to implement, even though I say that this class implements email contact, I don't have to have this function in it, because it's an abstract class. And I can't make one anyhow. I can't make an object from that class anyhow. I can, however, make an object from these two classes, grad and undergrad. And those need the method that follows that signature, public string, get email address. And again, in the case of an undergrad, it's the last name plus the student ID at college.edu. In the case of a graduate student, it's the same thing plus grad college.edu. So these two things have two different methods for coming up with the email address. And again, you know, substitute, substitute shipping calculation. Different things are shipped different ways, right? And might have a wildly different shipping calculation, even though they may be totally different in the inheritance structure. But all the things that you can ship will have a, a, a method to calculate the shipping calculation. All right. On the other side of it, I created a employee class and a faculty class. And the employee class is also abstract. 
and it implements email contact. But for this one, I said that faculty or, or all employees, whether they be faculty or staff, have the same rule for their email address. It's their first initial plus their last name at college.edu. Now, notice that because I implemented it in the superclass, I don't have to implement it in the subclass. As long as it's taken care of for a class, it doesn't matter if it's implemented in that class itself or in one of the ancestor uh, classes. All right. There just has to be something there if I call the method get email address. Right? It doesn't matter precisely where it's defined as long as when I call that, it's there. For anything that implements that um, interface and for all of the subclasses that implement that. Because if your superclass implements it, then you have to implement it too. All right? OK. So let's put together a test class. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create some of each of these. All right? Um, I am going to create some of each of these. And then I'm going to create a giant array list of people who are going to get this email. I'm going to loop through the array list. I'm going to create an email. And then I'm going to send the email to um, everyone. All right? Couple of things before we do that, and I made note of this. Um, I, I graded. I'm, I'm not exactly caught up. I think I'm caught up up to, but not including the midterm. And the midterm, I should have graded within a couple days. So I'm, I'm doing a knock on wood. I'm, I'm doing a pretty good job staying or catching up um, with grading in here. The one thing I noticed in your last lab is that people were starting to get a little sloppy. All right. Sloppy as far as a few things. First of all, uh, functionality was fine. Uh, the lab six that I graded, I think it was, or lab five. Lab five is, is one I just graded today. It, had, uh, it was with the, the student with the tuition and the payment. Um, I, I think everyone pretty much got that right, except for maybe a little problem here or there. But people that turned it in did a good job. The problem, though, is that some of the code is a little hard to read because it was sloppy. So, Notice, and again, God, you know, come to my house and you'll see I'm not a neat person, all right? But the code is neat, all right? And what do I mean by having the code neat? I mean indented, all right? In other words, I can look at a glance and, first of all, I have all the attributes at the top of the class. You don't have to do that. But God, if you don't do that, you're, you're going to be lost one of these days if I have an attribute to find way down here, you know? It's going to be really confusing. So declare all your attributes at the beginning of the file. What I usually like to do then is have all my constructors. So if I want to see the constructors at the top. It works if it's anywhere. So it isn't like a law. But trust me, some of these little things that you do to make it more readable are going to save you tons of time later on. And then other functions are just really can be in pretty much any order. All right. Um, but notice how they're indented. I can at a glance see where this function begins and this function ends. I don't have to guess. If this, for example, was indented, let's say these things were indented like that, it sort of looks like here's where that function ends and here's where it starts. But really, there's another function mixed in here. Yeah, I know. It isn't that hard to read, but it takes a little bit of effort. Whereas if you indent it, it takes no effort whatsoever to see where the function begins and ends. All right? And those kind of things add up. Uh, the other thing I would suggest is to give uh, meaningful names to your variables. Um, I don't remember which student. All right? So you don't have to admit to it. But one student had a variable called variable. OK? Six months from now, you come and look at that code. What was variable again? You're going to have no idea, all right? Or something along that line. So give it a name that represents what it really means, all right? Um, if the code calculates the balance, have the method say calculate balance, 
or you know, don't call it calculate, calculate payments or calculate tuition or something like that, because that's not really what it does. So give it an accurate name, all right? And indent, and have all your attributes at the top, constructors, then rest of the functions. Little things like that will make your life easier. They don't seem like much, but they will. Okay, so I'm gonna go and make a test class. And I'm going to do a little bit of testing at a time, but I'm gonna to try to test thoroughly, right? In this case, at the absolute least, I should create a student, a grad student, and a faculty member. I think that's all the classes that I have finished, all the concrete classes I have finished. So at the bare minimum, I should have those three, all right? Um, that's another thing that I found is people are really, unless you're doing some testing and like you're overwriting it each time, like you're going and changing it, you're really doing Testing a couple of cases, for example, for tuition isn't going to cut it. You need to test every sort of, I won't say literally every possibility, but every sort of groups of possibilities. So on campus or, or in county, under 12 hours in county, between 13 and 18 in county, over 18. Same thing for out of county, same thing for out of state. So minimally nine test cases for that. And have them all in there. You know, don't create one for in county, then change the variable to say out of county and rerun it. Just copy and paste it a bunch of times, all right? And in that way, you know, if you go in back and make a change to it, you can go in and test it. The other thing, the last thing I mentioned is, it's good to have a function that does just one thing, all right? For example, some people altered their calculate tuition function to, to calculate the tuition, and then subtract out the payments to tell me what the balance was. And I didn't take anything off because that isn't wrong per se, but think of how flexible it is if you were to have three functions. Calculate tuition charges, calculate payments, calculate balance. All right? That way you could get anything you wanted to. If we were running a revenue report and we wanted to see how many payments we got over the last quarter, we could just look at the payments. Or you could just see what the tuition charges were. Or you could see the outstanding balance. So you could get it any way if your class does this. Remember, when you're building a class, you're building a component. And you want to make that component as usable as possible. Now, you might be concerned about duplicate code. If I had calculate balance and calculate tuition, would I have duplicate code? Not if you write the functions correctly, because the code to calculate the balance would first call the function to calculate the tuition, then call the function to calculate the payments, and then simply subtract the payments from there. So you wouldn't have any duplicate code with that. All right, so let's write my test case. Public class unit test. Public, static, main, public static void main, that accepts a string array. Hope that's right. So I'm going to create an array list of what? Of email contacts. Now remember what that means. Email contacts is an interface. I cannot create an email contact object. I could only create an email, uh, I could only create an object that implements that interface. So really, that's what that means. If I say I want a, a list of email contacts, I want to implement. Uh, uh, the only thing I could put in there are things that implement the email contacts interface. And I'll call that list um, recipients.
equals new So I'm calling a constructor on the array list to create an array list that's going to contain email contacts. Let me create my first thing. I'm going to create a student. Student s equals new student and what is my I have an ID, a first name and a last name. The ID is an integer, the other two are strings. Okay. Now, I'm going to follow my philosophy. I'm going to do this a little bit at a time. So I know I have to test one of everything, but I'm going to test students first to make sure I get the right email address. To make sure, first of all, that this test class com uh, compiles. Because if it doesn't compile, then maybe I didn't implement something correct. Or again, maybe I just have a typo. I'm going to add that student to the email array the email array list, the, the email recipients a list, uh, array list. I can do that, why? I can do that because I've said the email contacts are what the array list shows, what the array list contains. Student class, does it implement that email contacts? It absolutely does. It implements email Contact. Oh, I shouldn't say student, I should say undergrad. My mistake. Because student is the abstract class. Okay, so undergrad s equals new undergrad. I could also make that student, right? Because I can, I can put an undergrad in a student variable because an undergrad is a student, all right? I couldn't put student over here, though, right? Because I can't make a new student object because a student object is abstract. So I'm making a undergrad object. I'm going to change this to g just because that bothers me, or u. I'm going to add that to the list of recipients. All right. Now, I could go in and I could create faculties and staff and blah, blah, blah. But I want to test to make sure this part works first. Always, you're always better off to do a little piece at a time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create my email object. Actually not. I'm going to loop through my array. There's another syntax for a for loop. Typically we've used a for loop to say for uh, i equals 0, i less than the length of the array list, um, i plus plus. And then we get the first one, get the second one, get the third one. The other syntax is, and I'm going to have to see if I remember it, for all are recipients. I'm going to Google this one because I don't feel comfortable about it. I almost never use this one because I, I didn't really learn it when I was first learning this stuff. Oh, I probably should say Java. 
for each, not for all, for each. So I say four. I see a typo already. I've email mail contacts, and that should just be email contact. For email contact are in recipients. What's that going to do? That's going to iterate. That's going to do what the for loop, for next loop did, where I had a four. It's going to, first time through the loop, it's going to give me the first element in the list. Second time through the loop, it's going to give me the second element in the list. Each time through the list, that element's going to be called R. And of what type is it? It's an email contact. And I know that's true because I said that that's what the array list contains. So I'm going to create my email object. I am going to, what does the email object expect? It expects a contact, a subject, and a body. So I'm going to go and give it R, because that's an email recipient. The subject is going to be Thanksgiving. And the body is going to be no school on Thanksgiving. And then I'm going to say email dot send. Send email. All right. So this will test to see if the undergrads work. All right. Because I've created an array list that accepts email contacts. If I did something wrong, I wouldn't be able to add this person to the email, to, to, to the recipients list if I didn't implement that correctly. All right. And then I'm looping through. I'm grabbing each recipient in the recipients list. And each time through the loop, I'm, I'm calling it R. And R will be the first element the first time, second element the second time, and so on. So let me go save this as unit test dot Java. Did I put a space there? That's weird. The font makes it look like there's a space there. Okay. Yeah. I do need to import the array list. Good call. I forget the name of the exact. So now let's go and try to compile this. Is 
is a nested email directory. And there's all they are. So, Java C, star.java. So I shouldn't have a lot of errors, right? Because I had compiled all those other classes last time. This error is just a bonehead typo. When you declare a class, you don't put the brackets there or the parentheses. Compile it again, and it compiles. Now I'm going to run it. And is that what I ex should expect? Well, the student email address is supposed to be um, the word to, or, or, or the, the, their last name, followed by their student number, at college.edu. So the subject's Thanksgiving. The text of the email, no, no school on Thanksgiving. So it worked. So that one, it worked. Now, we are not done, though, right? Because we have not checked the other two classes that implement that interface. So I'm not going to get rid of the undergrad from there. I'm going to keep that there. Because what if I'm working on this? Uh, or what if I, I get this to work? I, I then have to go back and make a change to something. I go back and make a change to something. And somehow I broke that email. All right. I want to know about it. All right. So I'm going to keep that there for what's called regression testing. Regression testing is after you've you've tested uh, something. Maybe maybe it's, it it gets put in production. A change is made to the system. You go and change the code, and you test not just to see if the new stuff works, the new code additions you work, but did you break something old? All right. If you're a good developer, you won't. Because if you're a good developer, you've written your code in a very modular way. So making a change one place shouldn't impact somewhere else. All right? And you should make the change correctly. And therefore, you should have no problems with regression testing. But unfortunately, not all developers are like that. And not saying you, but maybe the person that wrote the original code wrote the code in a very convoluted way where things are is very fragile code. In other words, if you change something in one place, it has an impact throughout the system. Well, then you're liable to find a regression error. In other words, when you fix one thing, it breaks something else. So we're going to leave the undergrad in there, and we're going to create a graduate student. And if I'm not mistaken, it is the same constructor we'll use all gems for the person's last name we'll use a gem themed all right and i'm going to add G to the list. So now we should get both emails, one to um, Lynn, one to John. And the email should be formatted correctly. In other words, the email for John should be Ruby4567 followed by the word grad, because they're a graduate student. And their method to give me the email address is different than the undergrad students. And again, through the interface, we, get, we, we have behavior that's polymorphic. In other words, we call the same function on the email contact. We're always calling that from inside of here. We're always calling that get email method. All right. But we get the right version of that method for whatever object we have given it. All right? We know that it has to have that method because we've implemented that interface. All right. Let me make sure I've saved everything. Looks like I have. I'm going to recompile. 
and rerun. All right. The diamond one, two, three, four at college.edu. Subject Thanksgiving, no school on Thanksgiving. To Ruby four five six seven grad at college.edu. Subject Thanksgiving, no school on Thanksgiving. All right. So we've done that. Let's now do to complete the loop, let's do a faculty member. And let's see what the constructor for faculty requires. It requires just a first name and last name. OK? Well, again, I'm going to keep those other things in there. Why? So I can do regression testing. If I made a change to the email object or whatever, run it through, make sure that it gets done correctly. So faculty f equals new faculty Donna Emerald. I'm going to add it to the list. And we threw it. And sure enough, that works. D. Emerald, which is the first initial followed by the last name, at college.edu. This email's formed address, this email's formed address uh, correctly. Now, because the algorithm to calculate the email is simple enough, all right, this is probably adequate to test it, all right? Because there's no if statements in there. There's no if statements, there's no loops, there's no real straightforward. So I could probably legitimately call it a day now, all right, and, and finish up the testing, all right? Now, again, a few things. I realize that I think, in my mind, inheritance is a little bit easier concept to grasp than than uh, uh, interfaces. Um, there will be an interface assignment next week. All right, I haven't I haven't developed it yet. Or I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to do. Um, make sure you understand this because you will typically use interfaces more often than you use inheritance, almost by definition. Why? Because a class could have multiple interfaces, or a class can only inherit from one class. All right. Um, when you think of, uh, again, inheritance, think of sort of the big isa, something that, you know, something really, you know, um, really is a strong example of such and such, as opposed to, yeah, that has certain behaviors in common with these other things. If there's just sort of a one or two behaviors that they have in common, then, um, then um, you know, think in terms of an interface rather than uh, uh, inheritance. Like in this case, it wouldn't be a good idea to make some kind of email contact like a superclass for all these things. Because really, that's not what these things are. Yeah, they are, but that's not really a strong is a relationship. It's simply a behavior that they have in common. These three different things, yeah, we can send emails to all of them. There might be other things that some of these things have in common. I was thinking of other interfaces in case I wanted to expand this example. But for example, maybe faculty and uh, or not faculty and staff, maybe, um, maybe fac uh, uh, employees and students are both uh, parking permit holders. All right. Now, you don't have to have a parking permit, do you? To park? OK. Not here, but in some colleges you do. You need, if, if you're a student, you need a student parking uh, uh, pass. All right. Uh, and of course, there's a faculty parking pass. And the faculty parking pla uh, pass allows me to park closer, all right? which you know, um, is, is welcome, is especially as we start turning to, to colder days and winter and so on. All right. 
But outside organizations might not have those parking passes. So another interface I might implement, but I would probably only implement it on the student and the faculty, would be, um, are they um, parking pass holders? So parking pass holder could be the interface. And maybe there would be get parking permit number and get parking permit um, zone restrictions. You know, it's like students could only park in student areas. Faculty can only park in faculty areas. Or maybe you have a, a handicap sticker and you can park in a handicap zone. All right? So maybe there would be a little more like if statements and all that. All right? Uh, so that would be another example uh, of this. Uh, and again, the, the beauty of these interfaces is you can stick them anywhere. You can stick them on any classes in the inheritance structure. All right? So if we have something else with the current inheritance structure, we could easily stick the parking permit interface on the, um, on the uh, employee and student and implement that there and not worry about the organizations, even though the organization was an email contact. That's not a behavior that organizations have in common with faculty and students. They don't get parking passes. All right? They have special visitors parking or whatever for those. Okay. There's two concepts I want to cover quickly before we get into our next big concept. And our next big concept are try catches and error catching. Remember, we've kind of played hard and loose with validation, all right? We've kind of said, well, yeah, okay, um, I, I know, you know, you could break any one of my code by giving uh, the wrong size pizza. To it, right? Because pizza is only small, medium, or large, but I don't have any validation for that. All right? Well, we're going to start worrying about those validations now. All right? And we're going to look at try catches. There's two concepts I want, to, uh, I want to go over now, and I probably can cover them in the next five minutes. I can at least introduce them to you, and maybe if we have questions, um, we can come back to it on uh, Monday of next week. First one is called casting. All right? Casting. Casting is when you do something like this. Yes, I can. All right, let's say I do something like this. I declare a reference called P, and P equals new sheet pizza. Is that a legal statement? Yes. Why is it legal? It's legal because a sheet pizza is a pizza. So I could put a pointer to a sheet pizza in a pizza reference. That's legit. All right. The opposite is not OK. Sheet pizza P equals new pizza. Why not? Because not all pizzas are sheet pizzas. So I can't put, I can only put sheet pizzas in a sheet pizza object reference. I can't put an ordinary pizza in there. Assuming, again, just to refresh your memory, that pizza is a superclass and sheet pizza is a subclass. So if I do this, I can call all the methods that exist on the pizza class. All right? And I will get the correct version of them. That is, I'll get the I'll get the, um, I'll get the uh, um, sheet pizza version of those methods. So I ask to calculate cost. I'll get the cost for that. I'll ask for the, um, you know, the baking time. I'll get the sheet pizza's version of the baking time and all those things. However, all right, 
If you remember, there was an extra L uh, attribute in sheet pizzas. It was something like stuffed crust. We said that sheet pizzas could have stuffed crust, whereas regular pizzas couldn't. So we had a method called is stuffed crust, or something like that. If I did this, pizza is stuffed crust, I would get an error. I would get a compiler error, right? Because all I've said is I've said it's a pizza. All right? I haven't said, uh, I've defined it as a pizza, which means that P could point to any kind of pizza. And therefore, because it could point to any kind of pizza, I can only call functions that exist for the pizza. I can't call any sheet pizza functions. That is, functions that exclusively exist on the sheet pizza class. Now, if I call a method that exists on the pizza, I'll get the sheet pizza version. All right? But I can't call any, any methods that don't exist on the pizza class. I'll get an error. Well, what are we to do? Well, of course we could declare it as a sheet pizza, then everything would be OK. But let's say we're stuck with this declaration of pizza. I can cast it. And I can say, sheet pizza s equals sheet pizza p. That's known as casting, all right? Now, in our example, assuming there was only these handful of lines of code here, I could cast p as a sheet pizza. Because when it was made, it really was a sheet pizza. All right? The, it points to a sheet pizza object. So if it really points to a sheet pizza object, I can cast it as a sheet pizza. And then I would be able to say S is stuffed. Because now we're dealing with a sheet pizza object. So I can ask sheet pizza methods. I can call sheet pizza methods. OK? However, what if I slipped up and there was a line somewhere in here that said pizza p equals new pizza? And it wasn't a sheet pizza. It was just a regular pizza. This line would blow up. Now, it wouldn't blow up when I compiled it, because the compiler takes your word for your casting. The compiler says, OK. This guy knows it's a sheet pizza. Who am I to argue? So it will treat it as though it's a sheet pizza. It will try to treat, uh, treat it as though it's a sheet pizza. However, if it finds out at runtime that you lied to it, that it's not a sheet pizza, all right, it's just a regular plain old pizza, then it will blow up. Because you can't treat just a regular pizza like it's a sheet pizza. Because a regular pizza isn't a sheet pizza. That's known as casting. All right. The reason I bring this up now is, is it's one of those sort of side topics that it's probably a good idea to talk about at some point. When we go over our first try-catch example, uh, we'll see an example of casting. All right. I deliberately generated some errors, and it took me to do casting to do it. All right. So uh, when we go over our first try-catch example, we'll see that. The other concept is boxing. I'll just take two minutes on boxing just to introduce it. Array lists are great, and they're wonderful, and they're beautiful. They have so many advantages over regular arrays, but they have one restriction. What's the restriction with an array list? Can you store primitives in an array list? No. You have to store objects. Well, what if I want an array list of just integers? All right? I can't do it exactly. I can, however, for all the primitives, there are these classes used for what are called boxing.
And you can tell they're a class because they start with a capital letter. And the nice thing is, is the compiler will let you treat it like it's a primitive. So I don't have to say integer y equals new integer. I can just say integer y equals 2. And it will create a integer object that I can treat like a regular integer. So I could say z equals y plus 49. I can treat it as though it was an integer. All right? And then I could add those to an array list. So I sort of get the best of both worlds. I can treat it like an object when I want to, and I can treat it like a primitive when I want to treat it like a primitive. The boxing and unboxing is simply taking an integer. Boxing is taking a, 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 an int primitive and sort of wrapping it up in an integer class. Unboxing is the opposite, taking the value of an integer uh, object and treating it like a primitive. So we can treat an int like an object by using an integer class, and then we can treat the integer, and it happens automatically. All right. So I don't have to write any special code to do this. Array list dot add y. It can do it because that's an integer. Only one drawback. There's always a catch, isn't there? All right. Only one drawback is when you compare integers. All right. If I compare, I don't get a problem there. If I say if y equals x, if I compare an integer to an int, it looks and says, hey, they're comparing an integer to an int. I'm going to unbox that integer and treat it like an int. It'll do the comparison. It'll tell me if it's equal or not. Of course, there's no problem comparing an int with another int. If I had an int z up here, if I say x equals z, yeah, those are primitives. They'll just compare them like you'd expect numbers to compare. The problem is if I have two integer objects. Because what does it mean if I say if x equals q, if y equals q? I'm comparing the pointers. Because anytime you're comparing two objects, even these fancy boxing objects, I'm comparing the pointers. So it's not going to work the way that I want it to. So if q equaled 2 and y equaled 2, if I did a comparison like this, I'm going to say they're not equal, even though they're really equal. All right? Their values are equal. All right? So you've got to be careful about comparing these boxed classes. All right? But other than that, everything is handled for you. So you don't, that's the only time you really have to worry about this. All right? So you could declare all your ints as integers from now on. The only problem you're going to run into is when you need to do comparisons. Uh, and it'll have the extra advantage of being able to add those to an array list. Uh, if you didn't get that completely, I think we'll go over examples next week uh, when we do the try-catch, and hopefully it will come clear then. All right, see you up in lab. <laughs>